The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein. I'm not even sure how I'm supposed to address you now. Uh, Mr. Are you Bron- just Mr. Bronstein works. Mr. Right. <laughs> I am a teacher, Professor uh, Bronstein. I'm sure your mother would uh, have loved for me to uh, address you as Dr. Bronstein. But that would violate AP style. No, I'm talking about like being a real doctor. Oh, not not oh. a doctor of education or anything like that. I see. Um, yeah, a lot of people uh, that that is an AP style wrinkle is even if you're a doctor, if you're a non-medical doctor, if you're a doctor of education, a doctor of philosophy, a doctor of theology, you are not referred to as doctor. Doctors are medical people. Otherwise, you're something, something who has a doctorate in English or some shit. Have, Have you ever written about somebody with a PhD and they wanted you to put that salutation in the, uh, copy and you didn't they got a little mad about it not that i recall have you um maybe not mad but they would have liked it to be in there and they were a little miffed no tough shit people pay a lot of money for those degrees just to have that couple little letters before or after the name right well you put those letters after right not before doctor Mm -hmm. yeah because it is misleading because people see the phrase the, the DR period, and they think medical doctor. It's not Dr. Jonah Bronstein, MD. People always leave off the MD or what you're a doctor of. So we, uh, the Associated Press, uh, to help folks out, says, if it says doctor, then uh, you, that person can treat your STD or whatever. Fill, fill in the blank. Your, uh, your abscess tooth. Uh, Jonah, we were asked uh, on Twitter from a longtime Bill season ticket holder who sits right in front of us, right in front of the glass in the press box, Tony Papagallo. And uh, he was curious that with the Suns being for sale, what the idea would be about bringing the NBA to Buffalo. Um, it's a tough sell, uh, not even a tough sell. I, it's, very, it's impossible. Uh, they already have a hockey team. I think that the chance for the Bills, or excuse me, for Buffalo to have an NBA team um, ended when the Braves left and the town embraced hockey. I think it could have been an either or situation and basketball would have been successful here, but not alongside an NHL franchise. And I don't, I just don't think that uh, Buffalo can sustain three major league teams. Um, but your thoughts with uh, the Suns being for sale after their owner uh, had been found to have been doing a lot of really shady stuff, dropping end bombs, dropping his drawers, pulling down other people's drawers, saying inappropriate things about your drawers and what's in your drawers. Um, and uh, now he's being forced to, well, he's, he's compelled. He is, uh, he is under so much pressure that he's decided Uh, decided to sell the Suns and uh, the Phoenix Mercury also. Yeah, well, you summed it up pretty well in some ways. It's it's not going to happen. As as fun as it would be, as nostalgic as some people get for the Buffalo Braves and would hope that the NBA would return here. And I do think maybe we could talk a little bit later about ways that I think you could incorporate NBA events into Buffalo, but an actual team moving to Buffalo from a market like Phoenix, the 11th biggest market in the U.S., and Buffalo's 52, I believe, is just not going to happen. I mean, the Phoenix Suns are going to be sold, and the owner is going to keep the team in Phoenix. They're not leaving Phoenix. It's too big and too important of a market to the NBA 
at this point, and they're not going to yank a team out of Phoenix just because they had a bad owner. They're going to find a better owner to keep that franchise alive and hopefully thrive. They're one of the best teams in the league. They were in the NBA Finals two years ago, and you know I, I don't think there's any chance whatsoever, not even a 0.0001% chance that somebody would buy the Phoenix Suns and move them to Buffalo. I don't even know who would have the money to buy any team and move them to Buffalo or have that inclination. The Pagulas aren't going to do it. And I don't know who else would fall into that category. As far as Tom Galasano could do it at this point with the cost of franchises, maybe, but I don't know. And, and well, he I, tried to buy the Los yeah. Angeles Dodgers a few years ago. I don't know. Maybe okay. I guess that was too late. That was 10 years ago. He but was part he of the, have, he was part of a group anyway. Sure. But in Tom Galasano owned the Sabres in Buffalo, but, is Tom Galasano that rooted in Western New York and Buffalo that he wants to bring a team from another city to Buffalo? I, I don't think so. Uh, Probably maybe, not. maybe we could ask him if he wants to. Come Tony to asked and, and uh, we like Tony. Uh, well, I like Tony, Tony's good people. And uh, it was, it's, it's worth bringing up. The, I, and I it's, like, a, it's a good chance yeah. to, to talk about the NBA in Buffalo period. Sure. It's a, it's a good, a good excuse. Yeah. Well, that's why I like the topic because people do talk about it and fantasize about it and ask about the possibility. Um, I don't, I hope nobody really seriously thinks it could happen because you're really going to be disappointed. Um, and especially with the way the dynamics of the NBA now, maybe there's a reality. So I, I wouldn't say it would never happen because maybe there's a reality in the future where the Buffalo market grows or there's some sort of change in, in the structure of things with the NBA or Buffalo, Western New York, that somehow it makes sense a century from now. But right now is the 52nd market. That's not a market the NBA is trying to get to. The NBA is expanding to Las Vegas and Seattle. It hasn't been announced yet, but it's been widely reported that it's going to happen. And the NBA is not going to be interested in expanding again after that. It took them a very long time to really get to this point where they think they can add two more franchises. And even if you're talking about moving a team, there really aren't too many distressed NBA franchises that are looking for a new city. New Orleans is probably the one that could move, but if they move and now Seattle and Las Vegas are off the board, but I think it's more likely that maybe there's a second team in Chicago or expansion into Mexico city or something like that, or a different kind of foreign market that the NBA can expand its footprint, or there's other bigger markets that once had NBA franchises like Kansas city. Um, I can't think of the others, but there are others. There's, there's much bigger cities that don't have an NBA team. That would St. make Louis. a lot more sense. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Or ABA teams in that case, that Buffalo would just be so far down the list. I just, the nostalgia that Buffalo has for the Braves doesn't go the other way. I don't think the NBA or Clippers who were once the Braves have this desire to come back to Buffalo. Now that aside, I do think it Let's would so be wait. Nice. Let me just, let me just for the record, mention a couple of market sizes. Um, Memphis is 51. New Orleans is 50. So uh, Buffalo is 53. I think it's slid a little bit, um, according to this list that I have in front of me. This is Nielsen Markets, which is how you sell advertising. Um, Memphis, 51. New Orleans, 50. Um, Oklahoma City, 44. Uh, Las Vegas, 40. But if you want to get into a situation, and we're not going to count Las Vegas uh, because they don't have an NBA team yet, even though NBA has a, a big footprint there in that town with all the different events that they do there. So 40 is, uh, let's put an asterisk on that. The city, the, the smallest market that has three major league franchises is Pittsburgh at number 26. Um, so that is, that's a big threshold to be able to handle three franchises. And of course the Pittsburgh pirates are considered, you know, one of the dregs of the major of the major leagues every year because they can't really afford it. They have a palace of a stadium there and people are never in it. Um, so, um, yeah, there are just some market realities that, that don't work uh, and probably never will work anymore in, in Buffalo's favor. And you look back at some of the reasons why the Braves left in the first place, the difficulty competing and coexisting with the Sabres when Buffalo was a much bigger market at the time but. and the college basketball teams that was maybe even the bigger issue uh because they didn't want to give up nights. their their key weekend night uh dates uh that bonaventure and canisius and niagara and they they wanted that arena and that's not a factor anymore but uh the whoever owns the sabers operates the arena they don't actually own the arena but they operate the arena so the sabers are always going to be 
the prime tenant, even if an NBA team were to come here. And it's when the Sabres and the Braves were competing in the first place, they were both new franchises coming into their leagues around the same time, if not the exact same year, I think. And now the Sabres are so entrenched, having been here for more than 50 years. It's such a strong hockey market with, I think, more people growing up in the culture of hockey than basketball. I mean, that's debatable, but I just don't see the market potential. I think if an NBA team did come here, they have struggle selling tickets unless it was a really outstanding franchise and a really exciting team to watch. And it would play out much similarly to why the Braves left because they weren't really drawing enough fans and making enough money. Now, could you bring a preseason game here or some sort of NBA related event, or there's ways maybe to bring some big college basketball games. I do think. What about a, a G league team in Buffalo or Rochester? I Rochester would make more sense. I, I did some reporting on this years ago and never really wrote the story, but I looked into it and talked to some people. Buffalo, in that case, is probably too big of a market. The, the G League doesn't really get into big markets, and they don't really get into markets with other um, professional sports competition or colleges. I, I don't know. It probably would hurt Buffalo's chances, even though it's not a huge college market, that there are four other college teams. Those aren't the places the G League wants to be. There was an opportunity years ago maybe for – a G League team in Buffalo. The other thing is there isn't really a right-sized arena for a G League team in Buffalo. The Key Bank Center is too big. UB doesn't really work with the way the state runs that. It, they just don't have that small size arena. Although there are Buff plans, State, maybe, Flickinger. Maybe. And, and there's preliminary plans to build something that might be 4,000 seats in Niagara Falls that could be the ideal thing. And maybe a Niagara Falls G League team. Maybe there is a potential there. But the window was about 10, 12 years ago when there were – you know, there were only maybe 16 G League teams and the NBA was pushing to have more G League teams. So every team would have their own affiliate. And if they're not there yet, they're very close. And teams like Toronto and Cleveland didn't have their partners. Now Toronto has their own G League team that they own in Mississauga. And there aren't really holes in the NBA farm system for a city like Buffalo to come in and, and serve like that for Cleveland or New York or Toronto. But if maybe something happened and Toronto didn't have that Masaga team anymore, that would maybe be some potential combined with um, putting Toronto games on TV and maybe setting up a G League team in Buffalo, similar to how the Bisons are that are the farm league team for Toronto and having some more cooperation with Toronto and Buffalo. You know, there's a much larger conversation, I think, with maybe bringing the Bills back to Toronto for the occasional game, maybe finding a way to have Major League Baseball games in Buffalo again once in a while. And perhaps you could work some sort of arrangement that involves basketball games. But I think the best thing that a Buffalo fan could hope for is an NBA preseason game, which back in the 90s and such, there were a lot more of those. It hasn't happened in a very long time. But I believe that if people want to see NBA basketball, they should be pushing the powers that be because it's a money situation to, to pay for having a preseason game here, bring some – if there's a local player or a local coach, Jordan War with the Bucks when John Beeline was coaching with the Cavaliers before and now he's with the Pistons organization, you could bring back somebody like Bob McAdoo with the Miami Heat and honor them. I think there's some potential to have NBA exhibition games, but the idea that an NBA franchise would make Buffalo its home again is a total, complete pipe dream. Maybe a WNBA team. I, I could see that. I think there's a lot more potential there, but I don't really think the moneyed interests exists right now to bring that franchise to Buffalo, but it's a much more realistic scenario. If there was somebody with some deep pockets that was looking to bring basketball events to Buffalo, I, I think there's some potential there. Um, before we get any further along in the podcast, I should mention that we will be joined uh, after the break by Alan Pupar he is a Dolphins writer since 1989, and he is with the uh, Sports Illustrated Network, and he is going to join us uh, to break down the matchup of so Sunday's uh, game that uh, just a few weeks ago, I don't think we would have imagined being this sexy, uh, but uh, sexy it is uh, with both teams 2-0 and heading into Miami Gardens. Yeah, but a very smart football mind that I watched the, the games with on Sunday before the Bills were played on Monday night has said that he thought that this Dolphins game was going to be a difficult game for the Bills from the start of the year, and now the last two weeks have kind of played that out. So if you've been following the Dolphins, you knew that they were going to be a better team this year, and that it, even though they had bad vibes all off, off season long, 
with the new coach and in the building and with the football roster, they seem to have some good vibes. And I don't think this is going to be as easy a game for the Bills as it has been in years past or that the first two weeks were against teams that we might perceive to be better than the Miami Dolphins. I was on a betting show about a month ago and uh, they were throwing different bets at me. And I said that I would wager that the Dolphins make the playoffs. I like that number. I don't quite remember what it was, but I also said that I would like to bet on Mike McDaniel to be the coach of the year. And the reason being is because coaches of the year generally come from turnaround organizations and with everything that's happened with the Dolphins off the field, with their ownership mess, Stephen Ross uh, in collusion and trying to bring in Tom Brady and Sean Payton, uh, the Brian Flores lawsuit, uh, constantly trying to swap out Tua for somebody else, including Deshaun Watson and just all of the, the turbulence involving the Dolphins, that if Mike McDaniel could get them into the playoffs, then that would make him a very attractive uh, candidate uh, to get votes for coach of the year. So, um, Again, it's just two weeks in, but uh, I do think that the Dolphins uh, are a team that needs to be reckoned with. And, and that's not to say that uh, they're going to usurp the Buffalo Bills as favorites of the division or anything else, but um, they've proven to be a tough out here through uh, the first couple of games against two good opponents, uh, the New England Patriots and, uh, and the Ravens. Uh, who had a 21 point advantage heading into the fourth quarter. That's, that's tough to pull off. Even if, you know, the Ravens being banged up a, a John Harbaugh coach team, uh, Lamar Jackson, who had an MVP caliber performance on the other side of the football. Uh, and still uh, the dolphins were able to come back from 21 points down to win that game is, uh, is impressive. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't want to say I want to see the dolphins beat the bills because I really don't care either way, but, it would be good to see that rivalry re-energize, especially if maybe these are the two best teams in the AFC East, but it's been a very lopsided matchup throughout Josh Allen's career in the last few years. And it might be nice to see, I don't know if two was really the right foil for Josh Allen, but it might be nice to see uh, a Miami team that has their version of Dan Marino against a Buffalo team that has now their version of Jim Kelly and get some of that juice back that made that such a, um, you know, a great rivalry to watch in the 1990s. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even go back before Josh Allen, there was an apathy in that uh, rivalry. Uh, people just didn't care uh, because neither team was all that good. Um, and then Josh Allen comes along and the Dolphins haven't been that good. So while the Bills have been on the rise, uh, the Dolphins haven't really done much. It doesn't um, even feel like the Dolphins are the Bills rival anymore. It was the Patriots for so long and even the Jets. It seemed like in recent years or in the recent decades that the, yeah, the Rex Ryan Jets aspect of it, that that really played into it. Uh, the different players that um, Rex Ryan picked up, former Jets. And yeah, that you're right. Um, before we get to Alan Pupar, um, uh, the Buffalo Sabres extended uh, general manager Kevin Adams today. Uh, your thoughts on that, John? It's a vote of confidence, and Kevin Adams has done a, a good job riding the ship. And for somebody that had no NHL management experience before he took over the GM role, and it was a pretty rocky start in that first year, and it looked like you know maybe he wasn't the right person for that job at the beginning when they had a very bad year and the issues with Ralph Kruger and the 18-game losing streak. But it's another – it's the vibes. The vibes that this team had with – uh, Don Granato was the coach and Kevin Adams is the general manager last year and all these new players. He, if he didn't win the Jack Eichel trade, he certainly didn't lose it. And some of the other trades and some of the other moves they've made, the draft picks they've made, the prospects, the way they're developing. I think in the last year, Kevin Adams has done a very good job and deserved the vote of confidence and, and probably deserved the contract extension too. I don't know what the terms of it are. And I don't know if, if the Sabres take a step backwards, if it's maybe an extension that doesn't look so good down the line, but I believe that just the headline and the, the good feeling going into training camp, Kevin Adams has probably earned a, you know, an attaboy and, and keep up the good work. And, and the Sabres gave him that today. Yeah. And it's a public declaration that we've done something we're proud of. Uh, we, <laughs> we hired this guy and yeah, he surprised a lot of people because as you mentioned, Jonah, he had zero um, hockey personnel experience, or I guess I should just say, you know, general manager type experience. He did coach and all that stuff, but, um, 
and had served another uh, in a variety of ways with the Buffalo Sabres organization. Been sure. A, I he guess earned, a good long time. He earned the employee. Pagula's trust. Yes, yes. And, and he's a uh, local with a likable personality. So I think that's part of it. And that, uh, you know, it's not the most shocking extension I've seen recently. I think Maurice Linguist getting that extension after his first year at UB with a four and eight record was a little bit more surprising. This is the nature of what you see a lot with coaches and general managers these days. If you're not getting fired, you're usually getting extended um, because it just helps with a lot of different things to have your people in secure contract situations. And, and I don't know the exact details. Maybe he was, uh, you know, on a contract that was set up for the way he came into that job and, and not really being an established GM. And now that he's established himself as a real NHL GM, he needs a more, a uh, suitable contract for the position that he holds. This might not be a contract extension that guarantees Kevin Adams is going to be the GM for life, but it gives him a raise probably and gives him a more palatable contract situation. You mentioned uh, University at Buffalo football coach Mo Linguist. Uh, UB 0-3 for the first time since Jim Hoffer was the coach. Uh, and... Owen four is looking likely uh, at Eastern Michigan this week. Eastern Michigan just beat Arizona state, got Herm Edwards fired. Yep. Um, I don't know what, where do we look for UB to pull out of this uh, Jonah? If it's not this week, I mean, what's coming up well, uh, and how, how bad can it get? I don't think the sky is falling and it can get worse. If they keep losing and they, and they, they struggle in Mac play. Uh, to win, I think that it, that gets worse than where it is right now. Look, they weren't really supposed to, nobody really thought they were going to beat Maryland. And that game at Coastal Carolina was a tough game and they were winning going into the fourth quarter. In some ways they, they played well and had a good game and, and let it slip away and lost. Um, oh, and three with the schedule they played now losing at home to Holy Cross was a bad loss, but this is a, that's a good FCS team. That wasn't a totally shocking result. I don't really think the sky is falling. There's people that tweet at me on Twitter saying they need to fire the coach. I don't think that's happening anytime soon, nor I think those conversations are premature. But this team needs to get better as the season goes along. They need to go on a bit of a run at some point or at least finish strong uh, to have a good feeling about where the program's going next year. And the coaching staff needs to figure some things out because I don't think the talent on the roster has gotten any worse, which is really why Maurice Lingus got his contract extension because he's recruited well and gotten some good transfers and it does seem like the talent didn't fall off and he might have the pieces in place to be a competitive team at some point, but they need to figure out a way to translate that into Saturdays, winning close games. They struggle in close games and get over that hump. And I don't really, you know, I think they can beat Eastern Michigan as much as it looks like, Ooh, they just beat Arizona state. That that's is a tough team, but Eastern Michigan is traditionally not one of the better teams in the Mac. And I wouldn't be shocked at all if UB went on the road and got their first win here in their MAC opener. And then, I mean, they're going to have a hard time getting the six wins and being bowl eligible with the way they've started. But I think they can be competitive in the MAC if they win this game. I think that changes a lot of the dynamics of what you think UB is going to be able to do the rest of the way. All right. That's a scattershot approach to what's going on in Western New York sports, with the exception, really, of the Buffalo Bills. And that's because we are going to talk to Alan Pupar from the Sports Illustrated uh, NFL Network uh, about Saturday's matchup right after this. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. I met Alan back in 2007 when I started covering the Miami Dolphins for the Palm Beach Post. Alan has been covering the Dolphins since 1989, and with... Perhaps a rejuvenation of the old rivalry. Both teams look pretty good at the same time, which has been a rarity over the last two decades. Uh, I wanted to have my good friend, Alan Pupar, on to talk about the Dolphins. And just let me give the correct introduction here, Alan, before we get started, because your title is a mouthful. 
uh, the publisher of All Dolphins for the Sports Illustrated Fan Network. Um, Fan Nation make sure, Network. Make sure that you catch his work there at uh, SI.com uh, with the Fan Nation Network. He is the Dolphins writer. Uh, Alan, thanks for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Always great chatting with you, my man. Likewise, likewise. Um, a lot of music kicked back and forth. Even though Alan is a native Canadian, I had the honor of introducing him to the Tragically Hip because he's lived in Florida since the 80s. Uh, and uh, Keen was uh, one of the ones that Alan kicked back onto me, and we went back and forth a little bit. Did you... Did you feel uh, or have you have you since learned about the Tragically Hip? Uh, because I thought that that was part of your um, Canadian birthright, that you had to be a Tragically Hip fan. And when we began talking about that and let's say, oh, I don't know, 2008, mm -hmm. and you hadn't heard of the Tragically Hip, I was shocked. I bet you were disappointed, too. Your, 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 opinion, of me, your opinion of me dipped. I feel dip like I'm more of a Canadian having lived in Buffalo uh, than you are having been born there and not lived there since the 80s. It might be an Ontario thing. That might be why. I, I don't know that they were necessarily that big in, in Quebec or the Montreal area, which is where uh, I was born and grew up. So I think that maybe that was the issue. Like my musical tastes, even back then, were more like like Br British rock, like Super Tramp Genesis. Celine like Dion. <laughs> She's got pipes, so not not necessarily my cup of tea for every song, but the girl can sing. You gotta you gotta give her that. So no, I never heard. I never heard of them that, that much. And I wasn't a huge Rush guy. Um, and you say that to a Rush fan, it's basically you just committed murder or something. It's like, how dare you, especially if you're Canadian. But it, it wasn't my wheelhouse. My wheelhouse was, like I said, was more like British rock. So, well, I, we're, I go to the we, box and I feel shame. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They, <laughs> thankfully, we won't be talking too much longer about music uh, because people aren't tuning in for that. They want to preview this suddenly hot. Bills at Dolphins matchup. Um, I, I think heading into the season, uh, a lot of people didn't factor this having so much juice to it. This is a sexy game this week. Um, and a big reason why is because uh, the Dolphins were being written off, not necessarily from a competitive standpoint, but because of all the turmoil. And I, I've thought all along that the Dolphins were the second best team in the AFC East. However, everything that's been going on, it had to be a distraction. These are human beings that have to get ready to, uh, for a season, you know, going back three months. Well, I'm talking. All right, let let. Well, let me ask you that, Alan. I'm not. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm not buying that. I okay. Well, let me. Go ahead. Let me set you up. Let me set you up. Where things are now, obviously, everybody's pretty happy. But let's go back eight months, three months, with everything going on with the Tom Brady, uh, Sean Payton rumors, uh, the Brian Flores lawsuit, uh, the punishment coming down against Stephen Ross, um, the idea that this organization wasn't all in on Tua based on going after Deshaun Watson pretty, you know, relatively recently, there seemed to be even some internal doubt of we are not good enough. And it's hard for, I think the, the national media or even fans to buy into the dolphins. If they themselves were thinking that they needed to nuke their organization. Yeah. Well, let me address a couple of things here quickly. If I made the number, the more, number one, thing you don't is, have to do it quickly. We got plenty of time. Okay, cool. I, even better. Well, I, I'm one of those. I don't buy this notion of distraction. I think that's one of the most overblown theories, notions, ideas in sports. Uh, these guys are paid to play games, pay me my money. I'm going to practice hard when the game comes, I'm going to show up. Whatever happened in the periphery of the players, Brian Flores, a lawsuit, Stephen, Stephen Ross, the, the accusation of tanking, of tampering, the loss of the two draft picks, which is going to hurt the franchise down the road. It doesn't mean jack to the players on this current team right now. I don't buy that for a second. Now, the issue with Tua and the whole the whole thing of like th there was a lot of doubt about him, with, wasn't good enough and all that, and they made like they flirted and that's being putting it mildly with the idea of Deshaun Watson last year, the tampering with Tom Brady. Um, so clearly they have not felt like he was necessarily the guy moving forward, and they're going to have a big decision to make following this season. Once they hired Mike McDaniel as their head coach, from that point on, they have been pushing to a, is the guy we're behind them like I've never seen before in my, my very, very long journalistic career because I'm old. I have never seen anything resembling it. I mean, it started, the head coach is on a flight coming down to South Florida 
to sign his papers and do his press conference and meet the players and all that. And they film him on the phone, FaceTiming Tua, telling him, I can't wait to work with you. You're my guy. We're going to do this. And every chance that Mike McDaniel has had from that point on, Tua's great, plenty of confidence. He's going to get it done. Then they they make the big trade for Tyree Kill. Every chance. He's more accurate than Patrick Mahomes. He's, he's crazy how good he is. And, all, and every player has been like that. So they have bought it. The big thing with the Dolphins, and this is where I said also, is we can hear all as much as we want about Mike McDaniel being this offensive genius, creative genius, and all that. He went to Yale, by the way. I don't know if you if you're aware of that. Just like Ryan Fitzpatrick went to Harvard. Did you know that? Um, right. You know, it's shocking. Eh? So anyway, this whole Chris thing Hogan is, played lacrosse. Yes, he did. How about his 7 11? Um, so we have this idea of what he could be, but until you actually see it, you just don't know. So I go into this season, I'm one of those. And it's almost blasphemy to say this in South Florida on Dolphin Twitter that Tua is limited physically as a quarterback. And I'm just sorry, just can't get around it. That's a fact. So I've made the point all along that if everything around him works, functions very well, Tua will get the ball to the people who need to get the ball. But if it's things break or if he's off schedule, then we got a problem. Um, what I what I didn't know and what I've come to find out the first two weeks especially last Saturday, Sunday is the play designs and the play calling is like, woo, man, that's some good stuff. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to say that guy can coach, but I'm, I'm getting there pretty fast. Um, so this is why now, whereas to me, the dolphins were a great unknown heading into the season. Uh, now it's like, okay, now I've seen a little bit of a glimpse of what this guy can do game plan wise and scheme wise. And, I, I'm, I'm a believer in that more often than not, he's going to get results offensively. Yeah, it is just two weeks. So we can't say that we know exactly what we're looking at yet. Uh, teams have the ability to adjust and uh, he's not going to catch anybody by surprise uh, as the, he'll do that less and less as the season progresses. Uh, but yeah, really fun team to watch through the first couple of weeks. Um, you know, Tua having 469 yards and six touchdowns and a really great day. Um, and he can have a smile on his face through, you know, when he goes to bed at night after these first couple of games. But for me in that preseason and ever since Mike McDaniel's hire, you mentioned to me, it just seemed like suspicious propaganda. Like they really needed to salvage this guy's psyche. And that's not to say that they weren't genuine in the fact that yes, he's going to be our quarterback, but it seemed like this concerted effort was necessary to make sure that this guy, if he was going to be their quarterback, at least had his head in the right direction. How much do you think it was just that they needed to salvage a relationship that ha- that was pretty dinged up with their quarterback? Well, yeah, but the, the previous head coach, who, by the way, whose name is practically never mentioned at the facility, even though he coached there for three years and produced two winning seasons, um, clearly was not a huge fan of the a huge believer in the guy. And I think some of it was like, yeah, let's, here's the thing is, again, this is his third year. Next off season is when they can give him a contract extension. If they choose next year is when they have to decide whether to pick up the fifth year option. So I think once the Brady's idea was shot down, then they realized, okay, I think they stopped looking. They, they decided we let's, let's fully, fully evaluate the guy, put everything in his corner including getting Tyreek Hill, including signing Teron Armstead, bringing the speed with Chase Edmonds, Raheem Mostert, Cedric Wilson Jr., um, and bringing a head coach who basically is going to convince us that he can make it work with Tua and put everything in his corner, and then let's see if it works, and then maybe we'll know if we have our guy for the long term, and then if we don't, then we need to move forward. But let's put everything in his corner including the full backing of the organization, but you, cause you're not wrong. Um, the whole praise nonstop was been a little over the top. Um, I'll give you one example and you've covered the NFL for a long time. When they announced their team captains, Mike McDaniel made it a point to say that Tua got by far the most votes of any player on the team. I don't know about you. I have, I had never heard a coach specify who was the leading vote getter, let alone by far. So to me, it was just a continuation of we're going to pump this guy's tires and let's see where that takes us. 
It's been a nice push through the first two weeks anyway to go into the fourth quarter down 21 points, um, regardless of who you are, to have it between the ears, uh, to get it done on the road against a pretty good team. And I know that Baltimore got a little banged up during that game, and that helped you know free up some of that space in the deep secondary uh, in the fourth quarter. But still, I mean, Tua, he's got to he's got to be uh, have a lot of cockiness, uh, and I'm saying that in a healthy way to be able to pull that off. As you're watching it, what are you thinking as a longtime Dolphins observer and knowing all this turmoil and turbulence that this organization's been through uh, for the last uh, you know ten months? Um, but what, what's what? How is your brain processing what you were seeing in the fourth quarter on Sunday? Well, at at first it was like, well, if you notice, actually, the the the, the comeback started is after the Lamar Jackson play made it thirty five fourteen. There was one final play in the third quarter, and boom, is a thirty three yard completion to Jalen Waddle over the middle. So it's like, okay, well, they're not giving up. Um, and then w- what impressed me about Tua is he was like very much under control. I don't necessarily think he made a whole lot of throws where I would go, whoa, like a whole lot of Josh Allen, Justin Herbert type throws. But he was distributing the ball, doing the point guard thing, as, as they say, and he was doing it very well. And then there were two monumental blunders in the Baltimore secondary on the two long Tyreek touchdowns. And once they got the one that made it 35 28, it was like, holy smokes, they might actually win this game. But Al, when you say the monumental blunders, you know, it's funny. Tyreek Hill has uh, the tendency to do that. You know, you, you can take a look at like the Bills with the final 13 seconds uh, in, in that playoff game. Uh, and you can say, man, what a breakdown or what a, what a bad play. But that's what great players like Tyreek Hill do. They make you make mistakes. It's, so yeah. it's not as though you can just justify it and saying, well, if, if not for that blunder, uh, they don't win. Well, that's true. Well, if, if Tyree kills not on the field, they don't win. And that's what made the blunder in, in so many ways, you know? Yeah. But Tim, here's the thing. If you saw the replay of the, the, the last touchdown, the last Tyree kill touchdown, it's a blunder for the safety who's supposed to provide deep help not to go true. over. True. True. Okay. And, and on the first one, it's a blunder for Kyle Hamilton, who, by the way, I, I was told was this superstar prospect can't miss who basically freezes and watches Hill sprint by Marcus Peters, who by the, who also completely gives up on the play, never turns around on an underthrown ball. And I'm not going to say he could have made a play on it, but maybe he could have. I don't know. Um, so here's the thing. I'm not going to take away from Tyree Kill. Nobody's been, nobody's covering him. I watched, I watched training camp and he was, he was open by five yards the entire camp. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, is this a is this a, a a function of the defense not doing what they're going to do during the regular season? Do they want the offense to click, and it's more important that 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 they work on that? So they're kind of maybe playing soft. And then they have joint practices with Tampa Bay, and in the first two games, and still nobody can cover the guy. He is he is wide open all the time. It's crazy. But those two plays, there are other plays where it's just great work by Tyree, great work by Tua getting him the ball. Those two plays. I don't mean to offend anybody, but yeah, those were two bad blunders by the Baltimore secondary. And how much of that is a function of Tyree Kill being the fastest player in the NFL? And I think he scares defenders. And that's maybe why not they're in the wrong Sorry, position. not buying it. No? Not buying it. I mean, it's seriously, literally, and this is John Harbaugh saying it, that like somebody was supposed to provide deep help on the second one. And so the cornerback at the line basically just lets Tyreek run by him. I mean, I could have run by him and don't think anybody's ever. Eh, Come eh, on, Tim, be nice. Eh. Well, if he wasn't going to. If you, if you had your ice skates on, maybe. If you had your ice skates on. Backpedal, I could have run by, by him. Uh, what, it, what are your thoughts on this matchup here? Now that we have two games of insight uh, that we know now about Mike McDaniel and his team, and we've seen. To uh, throw into Waddle and to Jacecki and to Hill, and he's getting some protection, and the defense is playing okay. Uh, um, what what are your thoughts on just this this collision between? And I think also the Dolphins giving a big hint of some separation between themselves and the Patriots with what happened in Week One. Now the Bills don't play the Patriots until December, so they get both of those games late. 
But to see what we did uh, on opening day with the Dolphins thumping the, the Patriots, um, we've now, I think, are pr- okay. I need to I need to tap my own brakes here because it is just two weeks and we don't know what we're looking at on this field until October. I say that all the time. You really don't know what you have for almost halfway into the season. Can you, whether it's you're a fan, whether you're a gambler, whatever it is, to be able to handicap and size up matchups, it's tough, especially with a brand new coach on one of these teams. Um, but anyway, this is a big game. It's a sex. It's a sexy matchup that I don't think uh, three weeks ago we were looking at as probably the sexiest uh, of the week. And this is right at the top of the list. Oh, no question. And it's it's to me, it's kind of a semi. And I, I understand why. But to me, it's still offensive that that it's to me, it's clearly the matchup of the week. And it's still not deserving, not worthy of Jim Nance and, and Tony Romo, who. God forbid they don't cover Patrick Mahomes one week. You know, the, the, the entire infrastructure of television might fall apart. Anyway, my little rant aside, I, I, I have, as opposed to predicting it, I, I, I go a lot of different ways with this. Is number one, yes, Buffalo has completely owned the Dolphins in, in, in recent years. It's like seven in a row they've beaten them. I look at a couple of things. Number one is the Dolphin defense actually played pretty well in those two games last year. It's just that their offense was so insanely bad that eventually it, the defense caved in the second half and then they couldn't hold off Josh Allen. So because you wrote a piece about that today and pointing out, and I'd forgotten well, myself, the, the, the most recent, or was it the first one? One of the games, the score was tied at three at halftime. That's all the second game in right. uh, Highmark, Highmark Stadium. Um, no, and even even beyond that, the Dolphins held them to a three and out on the Buffalo's first possession of the second half. But then the Dolphins had two three and outs, and then at that point, I think Josh Allen said, "Okay, that's enough. We let you hang around long enough." Um, so I do think the Dolphins have the ability on defense to make it work. Except Byron Jones is already on reserve PUP; he's not playing, and now Xavier Howard didn't practice Wednesday because he's got a groin injury. So. That's highly problematic because even if he does play, he's got a groin injury. And if you saw the 75 yard touchdown pass he gave up against Rashad Bateman, I don't see Xavier Howard giving up that kind of long touchdown that often. Could he could he have been hurt before that or on that play? I don't know. Um, on the other side, the Bills are banged up in their secondary too. I, two I, neck no, injuries gonna... with uh, you know Micah Hyde and uh, and Dane Jackson. Neither of them practiced. Uh, Jordan Phillips didn't practice on Wednesday. You're talking about neck injuries. Even if those guys are okay-ish, you you don't want them. You you want to err on the side of caution with bringing them back too soon. So uh, the Bill, I mean uh, Tyree Kill and and Jalen Waddle are, might have uh, some fun uh, against this Bills secondary. No, no question. That was Two rookie cornerbacks, you know? No, no, and I was going to bring that up. The other issue is the Bills also have their injury issues. So that's that. And if the offensive line, which gave to a great protection Sunday, there was one sequence where they let Justin Houston come in free, three straight plays, and the rest of the game, I don't know that anybody got a, got a hand on Tua. Um Obviously, it's not going to be that clean against the Bills because the Bills can rush the passer. But if they can somehow make it reasonable, unlike what happened at the Hard Rock Stadium last year, when basically the quarterbacks, either were two or Brissett, couldn't take three, st- three steps back without having somebody in their face, then it's good luck Buffalo covering those guys. So, yeah, I, I think the possibility does exist. I think if there's this notion out there that the Bills – there's no way the Dolphins can hang with the Bills. I'm not buying that. I think the Dolphins absolutely can hang with the Bills. Jonah, anything for Alan? Do you think the weather will be much of a factor? Traditionally, that has played against the Bills, the heat and the humidity early in September, but the last few years, it really hasn't. Is that an overblown factor in this kind of matchup? Yeah, it might be. And I know I know a lot was made of the September weather. Um when Don Shula was a head coach and the factor that I was always left out, well, yeah, the Dolphins always had great teams, period, you know, weather, weather aside. So I, I think, I don't think it's nearly as significant. Let's put it this way. It's not nearly as significant as if it's windy and snowy in Buffalo when the teams play again in December. 
Yeah, and I think that uh, I was stunned that it wasn't more of a factor in the Thursday night opener against the Rams because even though Southern California is not known for its humidity, that canopy on SoFi Stadium and the stadium is down, built down into the ground. You know, you walk in at the 200 or 300 level practically, uh, and it's just, it was oppressive, the heat, just the body heat of the people in there before the game. It just, it was miserable, and it didn't really seem to matter. And I, and I wonder if that's because it was such a hot summer in Western New York that training camp maybe helped get the Bills a little bit more uh physically prepared for these uh, early warm weather or, or uh, geographical, you know, matchups where they have to, to worry about uh, the climate. Um, yeah, that'll be interesting for, for both of you guys, but maybe Elaine more than Tim, but Tim, you've been down there enough to know. And I have never been down there. There's a lot of bills fans that attend these games in Miami. How much does that help the bills? You know, how much of a split crowd does it tend to be? with so many Bills fans making that trip and snowbirds down there that uh, our Bills fans are already and live in Miami. All right. Well, my guess on this is, and I'll jump in just real quick with Alan, just because I don't think he really knows the travel aspect of Bills fans. There are so many travelable games for the Bills this year that it used to be everybody, if you were going to pick a road trip, you wanted to go to the Dolphins game because of the it's Miami. Whereas now you have fans who want to go for the matchup because the bills are good. So you had a lot of people spend their money to go to Los Angeles for the opener. Um, you're going to have people who are going to, are going to want to go to Kansas city uh, in, uh, in week six. Um, you're going to, I mean, now nah, Detroit, no. All right. So I guess maybe, maybe Cincinnati in January. So I'm guessing just from a financial standpoint, you can't go to all these games, but um yeah, this could be. I, I think I still think there'll be a good crowd uh, for this game. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, in uh, uh, I got a kick out of this, and I mentioned it on the Channel Four show that I do the pregame. I was listening to Los Angeles Sports Radio the day before that game, and the two announcers or the the, the, the co-hosts were talking about how big the crowd is going to be and if they expected many Bills fans. And the one guy said, I think it could be close to 50-50. And the other guy said, absolutely not. Uh, they're raising a banner in Los Angeles. Uh, this is a good team. Uh, the last time the Bills fans were uh, were here, uh, they it was more like 50-50, but the Rams are good now. Well, the, 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 the Bills were awful then too. And it was the Coliseum, which seats 100,000, and everybody spread out. And rest assured, it was close to 50-50. When the Bills scored a touchdown against the Rams, uh, you heard more cheers than boos. But um, what, what do you think? Because it's, that has been a case for the Dolphins when they've been a bad organization that they have to turn, they, they don't get the crowd. They, they don't get the crowd, and then you get a crowd that's almost half of the other team, like the Bills, the Jets, the Patriots. Or like um, in a Panthers game, right? Yep, pretty much. No, yeah. but no, nobody's from here. You know, you know the deal. Um, the thing is, I, I can tell you that the Dolphins sold out their season ticket memberships before the season. So maybe that skews a little bit more towards that side where it might not be quite like in the past, it was close to a 50, 50 crowd. Now let's say I'd may, I would think it would be sway more towards the dolphins, maybe, I don't know, 65, 35, that neighborhood, but there'll be the, the the bills fans will be heard. There's no question. Do you ever find uh, with the players, do they ever talk about that as to not letting the opposing fans get into the game for, for a home game? Is that ever, a topic no and and and, and players have gotten so uh, the sword i can use without being necessarily insulting whatever they've, they've gotten programmed as to as to say like all the right things and all that like you would never get what the university of miami quarterback tyler van dyke said yesterday he prefers road games because there's no atmosphere at the hard rock stadium when they, when UM plays home game, you'd never get an NFL player say that they know better. Um, but I, I, it does it bother some of them. Yeah, maybe, but it, you would never get anybody to admit. That. What do you think are the big uh, topics moving forward? Um, as we look beyond this bills game, I'm talking about for the dolphins, Alan, with uh, uh, the upcoming schedule at Cincinnati Cincinnati looks raggedy. I know that they're the AFC champs, but they did not look good on Sunday. And Joe Burrow is going to have uh, have a real problem uh, if he can't uh, stay on his feet 
and that's not his fault. Their offensive line's horrendous at the New York Jets. Um, so those are two road games that uh, the Dolphins could be looking at victories there. I, I mean, I, we're looking at a pretty hot start, pot, potentially. No, potentially. I, I, I'm of the opinion, though, I think, I think Cincinnati is one of those teams where all of a sudden it's going to click. I mean, they have four new starting offensive linemen who are supposed to be upgrades over what they had last year and hasn't been that way so far. It's part of that that there's there's lacking cohesion among that unit. Yeah, maybe I, I can't imagine that Joe Burrow is going to be running for his life the entire season the way he he has the first two weeks. And you, this is a Thursday night game on the road. I, I think that one's problematic. I would almost be tempted to to think that the Dolphins have a better chance of winning against the Bills than they do that Thursday night game against Cincinnati. To be very yeah. honest with you, can, um, can you and can you envision a scenario where if the Bills do or if the Dolphins do win this game against the Bills, where it actually becomes a division race and maybe the Dolphins can win this division? Oh, no question. Um, there were some holes that sprung on defense against Baltimore. The only thing they did well on defense against Baltimore was short yardage run defense. That almost pretty much won in the game because they had their goal line stand and their comeback down 35-14 started when they stuffed Lamar Jackson on fourth and one. Outside of that, though, I mean, they sprung leaves. They gave up a 75-yard touchdown pass, 79-yard run. Um, Jackson was hitting receivers all over the place in the first half. That's problematic. You're not getting to the quarterback very much. And that, even beyond sacks, they're not hurrying quarterbacks very much. Um, they had that one, the sack fumble for, for that resulted in a touchdown against New England. But even in that game, they only had one other sack, and it was like a busted play at the line where – where Emmanuel Ogbo was only the team's best pass rusher was basically allowed to run free. Um, so right now, if the defense has its part in it, and again, based on what I've seen with the creativity of the play calling in the scheme, I, and, and I, I, I don't want to be a, like, you know, a prisoner of the moment, but some of the play designs I've seen and against Baltimore on Sunday, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to necessarily put limitations on what this team could do. Up here, it's almost preposterous to suggest that the Bills wouldn't win the division. It's getting to the point where it's unfathomable that they won't win the AFC. Or maybe it's the Chiefs are the only thing standing in their way. No, and if the Bills don't run into injury issues, I mean, that's a scary team because there's like there's nothing they don't do well. Um, I mean, they look to me, they look better. They look a ton better on defense than they did last year, and they led the NFL in total yards allowed. Um, they were, they were missed. It seems to me they were missing one piece and then they picked up Von Miller and all of a sudden that's that there's your missing piece. And on offense, it's like, it's a Saffold. I think is a great pickup on the offensive line, which may have been, if, if there was one spot to me from Miami where that looked a little bit suspect would have been that offensive line. Uh, maybe Saffold's a very nice pickup, but yeah, if you look, if you look at it very quickly, I think, yeah, it, the, the idea is that the, Nobody's touching the Bills in the AFC East. But if the Dolphins win Sunday, that First tells place. you – I mean, that, that's that's back-to-back -back wins at Baltimore and against the Bills. If that doesn't stamp you immediately as a very serious threat in the AFC, I don't know what does. Alan, before we let you go, uh, since this is uh, a, a deep dive into – the upcoming opponent and the folks here in Western New York listening in for some clues as to what may happen on Sunday. Is there a player that Bills fans might not have on their radar because he's not a fantasy draft pick or anything like that? Is there a player that Bills fans should be mindful of that maybe they, they wouldn't be otherwise? Uh, offense, defense, or does it matter? Whatever, whatever you want. Um. Like maybe a guy you thought had a really good camp, maybe he hasn't even shown much in the first couple of games for whatever reason, but you think, I mean, is there, is there a. Oh, un under that description, I'll tell you one guy who had a really, really good camp and hasn't done a thing in the first two games. And that's Jalen Phillips. Uh, the 2021 first round pick from the university of Miami had eight and a half sacks last year as a rookie set a rookie record. And I mean, he looked like he was going at a different speed in training camp. And in the first two games, he's barely noticeable. So he's one guy. Uh, I don't know how I would think Buffalo fans would be familiar with Javon Holland, uh, the free safety second round pick last year, who to me looks like, I, I, I hate to even use that name, but in terms of instincts, uh, I get 
and I, I please, please don't don't think I'm putting him in that category, but I get Ed Reed vibes from him in terms of instincts. Um, that's the kind of guy player he is. Um, so there would be two guys offensively. I don't know that there's anybody that you you wouldn't Raheem Mostert, if only for the fact that he may have been left for you know, his career left for dead after he blew out his knee in the first game for the 49ers last year. He looked really good last week, not only running the ball, but also catching passes out of the backfield. And they have him and they have Chase Edmonds on the other side. And with their design, they catch the ball and they have like five yards of, of free grass in front of them. And they turn like I did. I did the tally. They had 218 yards after the catch against Baltimore. I mean, that's that's some crazy stuff. That's wild, man. That's not we're we're not used to seeing that out of the Dolphins. No. Uh, all right. I keep saying one last thing, but let's make this a comprehensive Alan Pupar interview. And let me ask you uh, your thoughts on uh, the Florida Panthers as camps are upon us. You yeah, also uh, do some writing uh, for NHL.com, cover the Panthers and have for a long time. Um, well, just I mean, a, a quick and dirty thumbnail on the uh, on the Panthers heading into 2022, 23. Well, the big thing with the Panthers is the the huge trade where they kind of like blew up a little bit of their foundation when they traded Jonathan Uberdo coming off a career year and Mackenzie Weger, who was one of their top three defensemen, to get Matthew Kachuk from Calgary in a case that to me is going to mean you take maybe a step back in the regular season a little bit, where last year they led the league in points in the regular season, but you become a lot more dangerous in the playoffs because last year, they, 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 this was not a team built for the playoffs. There's too much finesse, not enough grit. And Matthew Kachuk is not only gifted as a scorer, he's also an agitator, a pest, uh, a brand, Brad Marchand type player who everybody hates except when he's on your team. So I, I really, really, I love the trade. I know some fans down here weren't necessarily happy with it. I absolutely love the trade because I think, in the, in the long run, if the goal is to go in a Stanley Cup, I think they're a lot closer with this particular setup than they were last year. What are your thoughts on from afar on the Buffalo Sabres? Let me ask it this way. What's more likely or what's less likely to happen? The Sabres having a better record than the Panthers or the Dolphins having a better record than the Bills? What's more likely? Or what's crazier to suggest might happen? Oh, I, I think the Sabres because it's just – and I feel bad for the – the Buffalo hockey fans, because my Lord, since they can't get it right, it's like year after year after year. Um, no, I think the Panthers are going to take a step back in the regular season, but not, I don't think that big of a step that the Sabres can make the, the gap that there was last year. Um, I do think that do think, but the bills are going to wind up ahead of the dolphins, but I think the Sabres finishing ahead of the Panthers is a crazier notion. How much have you enjoyed covering and interviewing Sam Reinhardt? He's. Uh, I've loved watching him play. I mean, I had heard things. Of, I had heard dodge. things about him. So uh, that's a dodge right there. He asked you how you like interviewing him, and you say you like watching him play. I don't. He's, he's a nice guy, but he, he says nothing. I mean, how's how's that? For, is that a better answer? No. He was a bit prickly. He was a bit prickly. No, in, no, in Buffalo. Oh, no, but uh, yeah, I had heard that actually, uh, but zero issues. But again, of course, it helped that he had a great season on a great team. Um, I think it might but, also have been the people asking the questions. Well, right, because maybe we're just nicer people than you guys are. Could that I be think it? That's true. He, he's considered very well liked by people that know him around the team, teammates and in, in, in the organization and the community, but not so well liked by many of us that had to interact with him in the media setting. Well, but here's the thing, though, is when he was playing with the Sabres, the questions are like, why are you underachieving? Why are you not playing better with with the Panthers, considering how well he was producing? And the questions are like. How much fun are you having? What's the key to your success? So I think, I think naturally he's going to be, he's going to be a lot more, you know, amenable to those questions. He just doesn't say anything very particularly exciting, but no, he was very pleasant and had a great season. He's Alan Pooper, publisher of all dolphins for the sports illustrated fan nation network. And he also covers the Florida Panthers for NHL.com. Alan, uh, great to see your Pooper? face. Tim, did you just call me Poupar? Poupar. Yeah, thank you. Did I say, if I said it wrong, it was unintentional because I know oh, how to say okay. it. It's okay. Poupar. Yes, that's Poupar, it rhymes with Boobar. The, exactly, or Babar the Elephant. 
that's how I always used to remember it, quite frankly, when we first when I first met you uh, is because I, I heard you say it and I always was worried about botching it. And so I just remembered it rhymes with Babar. There you go. This will be fun to see how the YouTube automated transcripts uh, handle these last couple. Of months. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be fine. I'll let you know. Uh, I'll let you know. I, I think it's probably going to be fine. This is the most stylish interview subject we've had on uh, Tim Graham and friends uh, because it's uh, it sounds good. I like it. Glad to be a part of it. Alan, uh, enjoy the rest of the season. Uh, it looks like the dolphins are going to give you plenty to write about. And uh, sometimes you're just never sure. And uh, I'm sure that you were wondering heading into that opener. And uh, now you got some juice, man. Uh, that'll, that'll be fun. Uh, thanks for doing this. No, absolutely. It does look like it's going to be a fun season. And Lord knows we could use one of those here. And, and now, now, not to rub it in, but now I know how the Bills felt for all those 17 years they didn't make the playoffs. Sorry. <laughs> it's been a long time. All right, Alan, thanks. Thank you. Oh,